Hey guys, my name is Michael James and welcome to the channel. So today I wanted to take some time and go over how working out in <sighs> quarantine and not so much as going over specific workouts because again, there are people who are going to do an in-depth deep dive into each specific workout that we may go over. But I do just want to talk about things to consider just because I have family, friends, and associates who are getting into working out during this time. And they just, you know, there's certain little tweaks and adjustments that people need to be aware of. So I actually have a nice little list of things to help go over. So you should be working out during this quarantine because unfortunately, this may go on for 18 months, according to CDC scientists and World Health Organization scientists. So there's that. Some people are under the impression that this is going to just be maybe a month, maybe two. So, you know, it's very easy to want to give into social media and a lot of the people who are very afraid and stay in and avoid everything. And first, you should practice social distancing. That said, social distancing and the orders give, put out as of today by, for me, I live in California, but for almost every state in the union is still allows for going outside for, if you need to go to the store or to go outside to exercise. So you're allowed to go walking, hiking in almost every state that I'm aware of that has a shelter in place in uh, effect. So that being said, if this may go on, let's say this goes on two months, or according to researchers and scientists, 18 months, are you just going to not work out? Or are you going to stress eat? Hopefully not. I mean, first, I know it happens, and the goal is to make sure to take this time to focus on your physical and mental health. I can't I can't talk about the physical, I'm sorry, the mental aspect and everything that's going on, but we can work on the physical side and get you started in the right path. So one of the things is to always consider uh, limitations, injuries. Uh, if you're overweight or morbidly obese, those are things to consider that may impact what exercise you choose. So please take those into consideration, talk to your doctor, or just take a second to kind of think of like, hey, this may be a factor because it is fantastic. I got back into running about a month ago or so, and I'm still running. So that is perfect for, hey, the roads are clear. I have tons of time. Fine, that is perfect. But for someone who, if you're overweight, that may not be the best workout for you. So that's something to consider. So we're going to go over a lot of things. And one of the things, so for running, running, we'll start off with running and we'll go through walking, push-ups, pull-ups, and hit training style workouts. And if you have weights, we'll even go into weight training and bodybuilding. So running is fantastic if you are in the ability, if you have the ability to do it. It is a very explosive, very dynamic exercise that can cause a lot of stress and strain on your body. That is one of the reasons why if you are overweight or have an injury, please, please, please do not jump to running. I mean, if your injury is something of your arm, of course, that's not going to impact your leg. But if you have something wrong with your legs, your hips, uh, or even your core, chest, back, all those things, your running uses a lot of muscle groups and puts a lot of stress on your body, stress and strain on your body. So that's just something to consider because if you haven't run in a year, two years, five years, 10 years, 20 years, hold on. <coughs> mm, that's something to consider. Please do not just jump into that because you will do more damage to yourself not taking the time to prepare. <clears throat> but let's say you are, you don't have that, or it's minimal, so you're still good with running, and you're going to start. Let me walk you through how I've helped people get into running who were not runners, who did not have those issues. You start off 
nonstop running for a quarter of a mile. Why? That sounds easy, especially if you're a runner, especially if you've run at any point. But the goal is, especially if you are not a runner, if you have no background, no experience, the goal is just to get used to the activity. People always want to go it, jump in, uh, full bore, and that can be the worst thing for you, especially if you have no background in this. So uh, two weeks of running three times a, three times a week, uh, a quarter of a mile to, if it's been a while since you've run, a half a mile. So that is a nice little gap. I'm sorry, that's a nice little range for you've never run, so just nonstop. So please, this doesn't mean walk. This just means you need to get go, and then we're not going to worry about timing yourself. The goal is just to get it done. So if you need, if you don't know distances, here's a trick. If you're running on a path that your cars can go through, go by or next to, you can just take your little speedometer, or sorry, your odometer, and then just refresh it and go like, oh, hey, there's a quarter mile. Now I know when I get from start here and I go to that tree, boom, there it goes. Or if you're lucky to live near a school that still has their track open, if or a public park that still has the track open, uh, depending on the size of it, sometimes a quarter of a mile is just a lap. And that's the easiest way. I love tracks. The few times I have been able to run on a track just because, hey, like I know where I'm at. I don't have to think about anything. So boom, there's one, two, three, mile, done. All right. So you do that for two weeks, no time, just to get used to it, just to get back into it, just to get consistent. Because what people will do is they'll start – timing themselves very early on, and that can get discouraging because guess what? You're going to get faster some days, and you're like, yeah, I just rocked it. And then you're going to get substantially slower on some days, and that's going to be really depressing. So the goal is to be cognizant of all the things that can go on and just get active again, just to get moving and to recover. So for me, I'm running five days a week, but I'm like that was after start starting up three days a week, doing a half mile, and then just getting used to that because that is a strain, that is a stress. So I'm like, oh, my lower back and uh, certain things. And then it's like, okay, I've adapted. So after those two weeks, depends on your goal. So for me, I'm not going to go into long distance running. There's tons of people who just want to get out there and run for – for I consider long distance any more than two miles. So they're like, oh, I do five miles, six miles, eight miles, or whatever. I don't want to do all that. My time is valuable. I don't want to, and you can, it's easier to get speed in shorter distances versus, okay, you run three miles. How do you improve that time? If you don't have the stamina to improve like every quarter mile, every half mile, every mile, that's, that's very difficult to do. So for just running for just a mile is the goal and being able to do a mile fast. So for me to get back into this, I start running and my mile was like a little under eight minutes. So like I think it was 7.50, 7.45. There were a couple of days where uh, when, I, when I started doing a full mile again, where it went up to eight something and then we're back to 7.30, that was fine. That, like I said, it happens to the best of us especially early on, the more you build up that tolerance, the more you can transition from three days a week to five days a week. But it depends on how often and you're uh, running and how what the distance is and your experience as a runner. Earlier on, I would just say just stick to three times a week, especially giving yourself breaks in between, especially for the first five, four or five months. Just get that muscle memory in there and get that ability up. And then you can, if you want to take it to five days a week, do that. Again, but this is just what I've done, and this is just what people I've worked with have done. After you get to the, so after the first two weeks of not timing it, the second, the next two weeks, you're going to time those same distances, and that's so you have a measure to improve yourself. So uh, that way you're not 
I, the day one, oh my God, my time was terrible or whatever, but just to give yourself a metric, like not to beat yourself up. So from after that two weeks, you're always going to start measuring it. Uh, from there, depending on how fast you want to get, this depends on what your course of action is going to be for that. So I used to, uh, when I was forced as a kid, to get into running uh, because running was a component for PE and especially in California. Your grade is tied to your mile time. So, hey, uh, you're a boy of this age, here's your mile time. That's Here's A, B, C, D, or F. And when you get an F or D, in my household, my dad got on me, so that was not allowed. So then I became a runner. <laughs> uh, so it's very easy to just get complacent and run on flat surfaces, which you should do if you have no experience. But as you are progressing, it's okay to work in hills. So for my runs, we'll have a big hill, uh, incline, a decline. I'll sometimes run on flat surfaces, but it's just that variation stuff. It's great for your legs. It's great for your endurance. So that's why that should be incorporated into it. So that besides just running, okay, and you will get, you will improve if that's all you're doing. But you know what people who do track and field do? They don't just eh, run my mile, run my event. They do sprints. They do things to build up their endurance. So, hey, one thing for speed, especially very early on, is suicides, which is you're going to start a basketball court. You're going to start the uh, right under the rim uh, at the baseline. You're going to go up to the free throw line. I'm sorry, the, uh, the, yeah, the free throw line, the three-point line. I'm sorry, the half court to the other uh, free throw line all the way to the end of the court and then back. So it's touch, go, touch, go, touch, go as fast as possible. And that will help you get little bouts of speed. So you're going to see yourself improve doing that consistently. And you're also going to do, again, running up hills. All these things to improve your cardio are phenomenal. So for me, the biggest thing that I've seen, so my mile is varying between, we'll say 6.30. There's been times where I'm pretty sure, although my GPS cheated me, uh, it was a six minute mile to up to like 6.50 something, but we'll just say, we'll just split the difference. But I've only got there because I'm also doing HIT training and we're gonna go into HIT training, uh, but improving your cardio and if you have the legs for it, will carry over to running. So you got your heart rate elevated and sustained and controlled for extended periods of time. That's of course gonna benefit on your running. Moving from running, so not everyone's a runner, not everyone wants to give running a chance or has the ability to do running. I understand. So walking is a fantastic exercise. I always encourage people to do that. I don't necessarily say walking as an exercise, but walking to get moving because like you have to walk to do everything else, so it's just lowering how to slowly build that up. So, uh, Japanese researchers uh, or J Japanese companies, uh, fitness companies, were saying ten thousand steps, and then, then after the fact, researchers said like, yeah, that's actually about five miles. Ten thousand steps is about right for what you should be doing. So if you're not doing that, so that's you should be doing that. So the goal, though, is how do you build up to that? For me, when I started walking and using my Fitbit, I was not at 10,000 steps a day. I was not at 9,000. I was not at 7,000. I was like five. And so it's just finding ways to get started, get going, monitor, and then see like, hey, where can I take additional steps? Maybe I parked a little further. I did these things. And over the course of months, then I started going from like, Five to six thousand a day to like seven, eight thousand. I was like, oh, okay, cool. And then when I really made an effort, then I got to ten that first time. And on Fitbit, it gives you a little, shows a little goal, a little star by it saying that you actually hit your goal for the day. I was like, oh man, that's really cool. Can I do that again? So I had built up to that, and that's something that you have to realize. Dude, walking may be innate, and almost everyone does it without any. Almost everyone does it without any problems. But it's still challenging, and so you can't just go walk 
10 miles, 20 miles without preparing, without building up to it. So please take the time to slowly, every couple weeks, try adding another 3,000 miles, uh, um, yeah, 3,000 steps to your goal, not 3,000 miles, that'd be insane. Uh, so do that, you will see an improvement. So now when I'm walking 30 to 35,000 steps in a day, that is nothing compared to what I can do. And at my best, when I've walked almost 60,000 steps in a day, like I've really enjoyed it, but you'd have to be able to build up because you're gonna feel pain in your feet, you feel pain in your legs, it's gonna be difficult. So please do not just jump in without, like for any exercise, don't just jump in thinking you got this, okay? Be smart about it. That way you can do this long and sustained. All right. Uh, so going out from these cardio things, uh, these cardio exercises, there are some easy body weight exercises you can do if you want to challenge yourself. Uh, so we're going to start with push-ups. Push-ups are something that you should be able to do. Like, it is moving your body weight. So in case you were for some reason on fell on your stomach, it is being able to push your body weight to get up. Not almost, not, not exactly, but pretty much everyone, you should be able to do a push-up unless you have some sort of shoulder injury or mobility injury. So how do you do a push-up if you've never done one? Well, first, there are YouTube videos that will walk you through proper push-up form. That being said, if you do not have the muscle strength to do it, you may not be able to do a push-up, like even just one. That's fine. You're going to do a modified push-up where you put your knees down, and the best range is to start, and I would say 8 to 10, just trying to go three sets three or four sets, especially early on, and depending on how your arms feel. So you may be able to get, hey, I did five assisted push-ups. That is fantastic on the first set, and then it dropped off. It happens, trust me. But the goal is, especially if you're a beginner, once a week. You're just going to get in there and try to, hey, give yourself recovery time. I'd say about a minute, minute and a half to recover in between sets. So that means, hey, I did five push-ups and I'm dead. I can't, my arms are uh, shaking and I drop. All right, cool. Minute and a half, go. All right, now I'm going to try again. So you will see progress. So that's why you can't get complacent once you're like, hey, I did, I used to struggle at five push-ups after the first one. And it was five, then four, and then two. And then if I did a fourth set, one, now it's a five, five, five. Oh, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Now, are you going to keep pushing yourself? Because I say five, but this is for beginners. Because there's going to be someone who watches this and says, like, uh, I can bang out 45 every minute and a half, which is fantastic. But this is just to get you going. Because you can always challenge yourself. And so, uh, especially depending on your development and your ability as an athlete, yeah, there's nothing wrong with challenging yourself to like, okay, I'm going to try doing sets of 20, sets of 30, sets of 40, and you will see yourself getting better and better. But you should because it impacts the chest, impacts the shoulders, it impacts the uh, triceps. And so you're going to learn how to do push-ups or assisted push-ups or wide push-ups or tricep push-ups. There's a whole wide variety to help you uh, work your muscles and your chest. So when I had a trainer back in 2005, he just, instead of trainer talk of like, oh, uh, the pectoralis major and specifically breaking things down, we talked about it as like, hey, the push-up works uh, your, uh, your chest, your outer chest. Uh, your uh, incline push-up will work the upper, or he said, uh, I'm fumbling with the words because he said like this will work, your push-up will work your, your outer titty, put, uh, try, uh, incline push-up will work your upper titty, decline bench or uh, push-up will work your lower titty. And then, especially for the inner titty, 
Yeah, trust me, it was, it was funny when I was doing this. You're going to do work flies. So that's why it's important to be able to do push-ups and be able to do a wide variety of the variations because maybe you are able to do push-ups and you don't have problems. That's fantastic. Have you tried one of the modifications? Have you tried diamond push-ups? Have you, uh, like, first, uh, no, not a big fan of knuckle-ups. Uh, have you done tricep push-ups? Have you done wide grip, uh, wide hand push-ups? All these little things, you're sort of like, wow, that really is intense. So I'm doing San Asylum again, and they have <sighs> wide push-ups and a couple of the variations and stuff that are like, hey, I was able to get through it, but I was drained and my chest was definitely had DOMS, uh, delayed onset muscle soreness, I think, uh, for like two or three days. Because it's like, yeah, this is working my muscles differently than uh, weightlifting. So these are just things to consider because, hey, you should be able to lift your body weight. I mean, out of bed, uh, in any of these situations, that's not asking much. That's not saying you're like, and, well, I mean, it depends on your body weight, but it is just a sign of a certain ability, a certain basic ability. So going on from by uh, the front side of your muscles, one thing that is criminally underrated, especially by females, I'll say, uh, is being able to do a pull-up. So pull-ups, especially now with the invention of the a doorway pull-up thing, and I have one that I was using yesterday. You can put it into your door frame. It'll especially get the wide one. It'll sit on your frame, sit on top of the stuff. You would be able to do pull-ups. So if you can do pull-ups, why do them the same way you do improve your chest? Which is all right, cool. I'm doing three sets of ten, working out. All right, I'm going to start increasing that slowly and building up. So I'm like doing uh, three sets of 20, three sets of 30, or three sets of, and so on and so forth. That said, if you can't do a pull up or if you struggle, hey, that happens. Like I can do a pull up when I first got into weightlifting, and my trainer teased me because like, oh, you should be able to because you're a guy, because that's the stereotype, and I kind of mm, avoided them especially when I started working out on my own. But once I kind of put that together is like, I should be able to lift my weight because it is like a sign of how healthy a development you are. You don't want, some people have a maldeveloped muscle, um, so muscle imbalances where, hey, they always did push-ups, So they have a terrific chest and then they never did anything for their back. And so then that can cause your shoulders to kind of roll around forward and issues. So if you're going to work your chest, you got to work your back, you got to work your biceps. So if you have never done a pull up, there's a difference between a pull up and a chin up. Pull up, your grip is like this. Chin up, your grip is like this. Your chin up will put more emphasis onto your biceps. So it's a little bit, especially not a cheat, but just something to consider. Put more emphasis on your chin up. So those are easier, but it is kind of recommended that you learn how to do a pull up. Because if you can do pull ups, you can do chin ups. If you can do chin ups, that doesn't necessarily mean you can do a pull up. So how do you do it if you have no strength to do it? Uh, if the gym was open, they have machines that you can counterweight. Uh, since the gym is not open, there are other devices. So you can take a band a heavy-duty band, uh, exercise rubber band, that you can attach to the bottom, you can step into it, and so it'll take some weight off. And so for, depending on what your muscle strength is, depends on how many of those you may need. Maybe you just need a light assist, that's fine. Maybe you need more, and they have different other types of equipment on Amazon or at Walmart that you can order to help assist you so you can Hey, you're going to do the same thing. I'm working, if you've never done it, I'm going to try for three sets of five. And after a while, after you've been able to do that assisted, you're going to try to drop. Hey, maybe it took two bands to help me be able to do an assisted pull-up. All right, cool. Drop it down to one. Oh, my God, this is a challenge again. 
and then you're going to keep going, build that strength back up, and then you're going to see yourself knocking out reps. So before this, I was doing weighted pull-ups uh, to help further develop my back, but especially now, I'll just, I have a pull-up bar. I can do that easy, and that's just a fantastic thing you can do to exercise your body. So, covered the front part, we covered chest, triceps, shoulders. We cover the back, biceps, shoulders a little bit, and uh, your back, especially your, your lats, which we do from pull-ups. So one of the things that guys don't do as often is legs, especially body weight legs at home. A lot of women will do that without question, like, hey, I can do body weight squats, and I can do lunges, I can do all these things, and not necessarily guys will. Lunges and uh, body weight squats are fantastic. You want to keep working your muscles, and if you're going to work your top, you're going to work your chest and your back, why would you not work your legs? Yes, you can hide chicken legs uh, in pants, but the second you wear shorts, uh, it becomes apparent. So you're going to take the same method that I've already prescribed with how to bend up, because you don't. that's going to require less assistance, but you want to make sure that you're obtaining proper form. So I'd definitely say go check out Omar Isaf on YouTube, or go check out Jeff Nippard, uh, Stephanie Buttermore, or Athlean X. Those are terrific YouTubers who will walk you through how to get started. And here's where you should be placing your hands. Or for uh, squats, here's where you should be aiming for and the muscle cues and the stimulus that you should be trying to go for. So we are flying through this. And are there any questions in the chat? OK, well, since there is nothing. What I did save is the high intensity, uh, high intensity interval training, hit training for short, or what I'm doing such as <sighs> Insanity Asylum, or there's P90X, or there's any number of programs, or even CrossFit to some degree is still high intensity interval training. So who's that for? That's not necessarily for someone who, who is just a beginner. I know a lot of people are big into, I'm going to get into shape, so I went to uh, this YouTube channel, especially since we're in the quarantine, this YouTube channel, and I saw these high-intensity interval training workouts that they were talking about, and the guy looked shredded, so I'm going to do that. That is not great. And it's not great because if you do not have proper form, you could be doing things in a way that may hurt you. And so that's one of my biggest things for... I'll sometimes rail against CrossFit, not because CrossFit, CrossFit's bad, and especially when I'm doing Insane Asylum, it's like, hey, I'm doing a lot of the same things which a CrossFit, because it's a trademark, CrossFit class will do. It's, I'm worried about form, as, especially as a bodybuilder, I'm cognizant about the form of the workout. And so sometimes people in whatever class, not just CrossFit, any place will just worry about, hey, I'm going to do this crazy amount of things, and they're not as focused on the form. Form will get you because you can hurt your shoulder, you can hurt your legs, you can do mess yourself up if you do not worry about your form. So that's just something to consider. So before you jump in, uh, like, so I jumped into Insanity Asylum uh, the first time, and I didn't know that it assumes that you've done Insanity Asylum, I'm sorry, that you've done Basic Insanity or P90X beforehand. I had not done that, so it was way more challenging, but it was very rewarding to get that done at the end of it, and you see your ability to go up. But that said, I still kept, made sure to focus on form. I took necessary breaks. So any workout class can, if they don't focus on form or workout program, or they don't focus on form, or understanding that like, hey, you need to sometimes take a breath because you're going to see your form drop or feel your form drop when it comes to like, hey, I'm doing push-ups because I learned how to do that. And you're doing the uh, seal push-ups where your belly flopping onto the ground and it doesn't really look like a real push-up. Yeah, you want to be able to maintain form. So those workout programs are fantastic. That's why, that's why I do them. But it's not just something to jump in uh, if you have no background, no present 
training or background. So for me, I was already doing running. I was weight training. I walked. So it was like my heart can, I was like pretty sure my heart can keep up with this because it's saying asylum will even tell you like see a doctor and all these other things because they're right. It is hard on your heart. And if you are putting your heart through that kind of pacing, like you want to make sure that you can handle it because your heart's not the muscle to overload and play around with because yeah you can have issues uh, or and especially that can have issues on any other part of your body any other muscle any other ligaments tendons and stuff because you want to be able to work up to that so I felt confident jumping in the program and I'm also if you watch me when I do it I'll take breaks when it's just like okay not hey I'm tired I'll stop but like I'll go to a point which is like yeah oh, man I'm losing my breath uh, I'm out of breath, I can't keep up, my form's dropping, let me take a break, breathe for a couple seconds, maybe get some water, and then start again. So those are fantastic programs, especially if you're uh, medium to advanced in terms of your fitness. But please, don't just rush off to do whatever, think about what works for you. Insanity Asylum is something that I like because it focuses on sports performance. So my running dramatically always improves when I do Insane Asylum because when I was doing today vertical plyometrics and I was doing uh, decoy split jumps and other things which focus on your legs and I'm jumping from side to side getting my heart rate is elevated and sustained but under control and maintaining that and then coming back to normal and then later on in the day going walking slash and then running like, hey, your body's used to like way more. And I saw when I first did that a couple years ago, my mile dropped by like a minute. I had never attained a sub seven minute mile in my entire life until at, in my 30s. So, like at 30, 31. Oh my God, wow, my mile times six something and down to six. And then when I got my mile and a half, down to nine minutes, it was just like, oh man, this is really good. Uh, that's just why I'm a big fan of this program. That's why when I, okay, we're doing shelter in place. That's why I went back to Insanity Asylum. But they're all good. YouTube, has, if you don't want to pay, YouTube has tons of people doing programs. You just want to look at what is it working. Some of them are just cardio-based. Even jumping side to side, which is in Insanity Asylum, it's not difficult, but it's just like, okay, so they did this, then you're doing standing long jumps, then you're doing something else, then you're doing something else, then you're taking a break for 30 seconds, and then you're doing it again, you're doing something else. So it's just, what are you working on? For me, since I am a bodybuilder, I do love weight training, I didn't want to just do something purely cardio. So I knew Insane Asylum Volume 1 is very cardio focused. You still do push-ups, but more so it's just cardio and body weights. Volume two has a lot more physical, like dumbbells included, using the resistance bands. Their uh, weights are, I'm sorry, their exercises are designed uh, with weights in mind. So that's why I'm doing the volume one, volume two hybrid, because it's a great combination of the two. Uh, and I, I like it. <laughs> but Maybe you don't want to lift, and also, I used to, I could throw around the 60-pound dumbbells and do dumbbell curls and just, hey, that's fine, but then as soon as I did Insanity Asylum and was swinging around the 25s, midway through when it just becomes a struggle to like, oh, lift the 25, it's because, hey, strength is great, but strength plus cardio ability to handle, hey, I was moving around and then lifting something is fantastic. And as a bodybuilder, I, I do know that if you don't focus on cardio, that's going to be the key piece. So yeah, if you just need to stand and lift something without, like you're still going to work your heart, but it's not going to have the same intensity as if you did burpees leading to dumbbell curls, leading into everything else. So that's why I prefer Insanity Asylum. But again, look at the program, see what they specialize in. So for me, that's why Insanity Asylum really did speak to me because it was talking about sports performance. And so as someone who had 
competed in sports in high school, had been into running, had done lifting and done a wide variety of things, that really appealed to me. But there are other things out there too. Oh, and we'll go into bodybuilding and weight training from here. I bring this up just because first, especially if you have weights and, and depending on your level, you may not need lots of heavy weights. You're like, I just needed 10s, 10, 15s, 20s, 25s, and I'm good, and that's everything I'm going to need. I wish, I'm, I'm envious because that's not me. But you want to work the full body, not just the problem areas or not just the areas you want to work on. Because some people say like, I'm just going to work on my bicep or my tricep. Hey, because I, oh man, I really want, look at that little horseshoe area. Man, look at the peak. That's, that's what I want. It's like, yeah, that's fantastic. But are you also working your forearms? You're doing dumbbell wrist curls because your grip strength is going to come from here. Or you're also working your shoulders because you need, like, these assist in your push-ups. These assist in so many exercises that if you don't work them, you're leaving things on the table. And you don't want to have those sort of muscle imbalances where, I mean, trust me, I've seen people who had only worked certain specific areas and they forgot, like, yeah, my shoulders might need a specific day. That's how I did that. And so that they, they have fantastic programs to look into bodybuilding and weight training to less like, yeah, okay, what parts of the shoulder do I need to work on? Because, yes, I was doing a ladder of dumbbell raise, because, but there's three parts to the shoulder that I really am concerned with. So I want to work the front part, the medium, and the rear, the rear deltoid. And those are things you want to make sure you're hitting because not everything is equal. So, okay, so I'm working my arms and I decided, oh, okay, fine, I'm doing that. And I'm working my chest and I'm working my back. Are you working your legs? Because again, that can be farmer's carries, to, uh, dumbbell lunges, use a lot of things you can do. But please, please, please look at how to get proper form. It, that's not the thing that you want to mess up on. And it'll help you, especially early on, develop those good habits. So anyways, that is it, unless there are any other que any questions on specific workout programs or things to consider. I just want to make sure that everyone is taking the time. Like, there's never been this sort of prolonged break as an adult in my lifetime that I can think of that so many people are going to be without work or the inability to work and they're going to have that time that they need to reflect and so your best point the best thing you can do is work on your physical and your mental health in this time because if this was over in a month or two hey maybe it's not that bad but if it's 16 17 18 months like, what is that going to be? Because, I, trust me, I know people are stress eating. It's common. It's nothing to beat yourself up over. But are you going to be able to keep up this level of stress for 18 months if that becomes the, the actual projected uh, uh, length of time that's being reported by social media? If that, if, When what's being reported by the scientists or actually becomes the same thing that's being reported by social media – like that is going to be stressful. So taking the time to exercise and improve yourself and push your body is the best thing you can do, like straight up, because you can't control what's going on in the world, but you can take the time to, these were all things except for walking and running. These are all things you can do at home. So you, there's going to be some people who at the end of this are... Worse for wear, because all they did was stress, which lowers their immune system, and they ate their face off, and they're going to regret it. And you could be that person who comes out of this, who has been practicing the social distancing, but they've been working on their push-ups, they've been working on their pull-ups, they've been running, they got like, they're like, all right, wow, I'm 
and all that can have a positive impact on your mental health because trust me confidence and belief in oneself is there in spades when you can sit there and take out take care of yourself physically especially if you were not doing that for a long time so please make use of this opportunity pick a workout it really doesn't matter. I love bodybuilding, but that's not what I'm trying to... Well, first, I don't have the full capability to do that in quarantine. But regardless, I'm going to make use of what I do have, and I'm going to get it in. Because the alternative is focusing and stressing on all the things you can't control. Versus what can you control? You can work on your nutrition. We've already done a video on counting calories. And you can work on staying active and staying healthy because... This can go on for a while, and you want to make sure that you're in the best condition. Some of those risk factors are thing for contracting the virus or being more susceptible are also related to being more really obese. And I think there was something in terms of your lung capacity, but again, I'm not going to cite that or quote that or whatever. But Regardless, take care of yourself in this time, all right? You guys, thank you for enjoying the stream. I will be back on Tuesday at 6.30 for more streaming on a different nutrition topic. I'll put that out. And you guys can follow me on first uh, streaming on Twitch, 6.30, at, uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then sometimes throughout the day for I do foodie and fit gaming while I'll do capturing gameplay and stuff because it's important to not just only work out during this time but yeah uh, Tuesdays at 6.30 I will be doing a nutrition topic and Thursdays at 6.30 I will be doing a fit oh, 6 or 6.30 I'll be doing a fitness related topic so you find me on Twitch on Foodie and Fit uh, twitch.tv slash Foodie and Fit or you can find me on Instagram at Foodie and Fit MJ or on Twitter as Foodie and Fit. You guys, you have a good evening.